There we go. Now I'm recording. Awesome. <clears throat> so when it comes to critical thinking, we talked about how uh, we may have an inherent bias, just the way that we go about gathering the information, right? So uh, doing a search uh, in a search engine. So there may be an, an inherent bias as to how we phrase our query, what we type in. Secondly, we talked about <clears throat> the inherent or the bias that may result from using a particular search engine. So we did talk about how there are advertisements that some search engines, actually most search engines, um, censor their results. So they filter, I shouldn't say censor, I guess it is censorship, but um, they filter their results so that uh, even though there may be information that is on the internet, Google or Yahoo is not, or Bing is not showing you those results, even though they exist, um, for whatever their uh, inherent reason is, they could have inherent bias. <clears throat> then we said, okay, so if we really want to understand uh, something or form an opinion on something, uh, we have to not be lazy. Laziness is the biggest hindrance to critical thinking because critical thinking takes work. The other kind of thing about critical thinking is that a lot of people don't know how to do it. And it's much easier to do if you actively do it. The more you do it, it's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you become at it. So practicing critical thinking is a, is a good thing. Uh, we tend not to uh, because it's easier not to have to do all this work because critical thinking is an active activity. It's something that you have to participate in. You have to think about. So the first thing is to identify what the, uh, the problem or question is. So what is it that I'm trying to find out about? And then how do I go about finding out about it? And, but really the question is very important. And that brings me back to the, uh, you know, what are reasons to, to drink coffee? What are reasons not to drink coffee? Am I muted? No, you're not. No, no, we could hear you. Awesome. Because I can, I see down here at the bottom that it says something, something is muted. Uh, I'm not sure what. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. <clears throat> It always helps. Uh, you guys help me out. Uh, so, again, with the coffee drinking problem, you know, uh, is drinking coffee good for me is inherently biased. So that's uh, it, it's something that we need to evaluate really in step one. Step two is to gather the data or the arguments or the opinions or the information that we, that we need, that we want. Well, is it really, it shouldn't be focused on what we want because we shouldn't have an outcome already in mind. We should always try to do research without trying to get to our preformed opinion or the opinion that we would like to be true. Does that make sense? like this fits into my worldview and I want it to be true. Therefore, I'm only going to um, focus on data that reinforces my preconceived notion. So we have to avoid that. <clears throat> so then we should have analyzed the data. So we wanna make sure that the data doesn't have inherent biases. And some of the criteria that we should use are, is this a reliable source? Or is it, you know, bob.com? Is it Bob's website? Who's Bob? Right? Who is, is this data reliable? Is it from a source that we should trust or we can trust? <coughs> or are they just pulling stuff out of their rear ends? Um, are they, 
are the arguments that they set forth backed by real data? Or are the arguments that they're setting forth just an argument? And uh, does that make sense? I can just argue something and not have any facts. Or I can base my arguments on statistics and data. And is there enough? Because I can also uh, argue and I can have a, like two pieces of information and I can base my entire argument on that. And does it leave stuff out? So is my argument based on an, on an incomplete data set? Right? I've said, hey, look at this, look at this. This supports my data. This is, supports my argument, I should say these two things, but then you, you should be able to look at it and go, well, you know, those two facts are maybe valid facts, but there are other things that you're leaving out. And by the way, a lot of people and a lot of um, uh, institutions uh, base their arguments by doing stuff like that. They just cite the facts that are, or support their argument. This is my conclusion. Here are the facts that support it. Ignoring all of the other facts that don't support it. Does that make sense? That's a very persuasive way to make an argument, by the way. <laughs> no matter how glaring the opposite side is, right? Well, you're missing the fact that blah, blah, blah. And that's obvious to everyone. Or it should be obvious to everybody. Me, but um, it, like I said, a lot of times we are lazy and so we're like, oh, whatever. <clears throat> I'll just take it at face value. So <clears throat> one of the things with evaluating the data is to identify whether it's complete data. Are they saying here are some things that actually don't support my argument, but the things that support my argument are overwhelming? Um, because there are always exceptions. You have to always be careful about, I talk a lot in general terms, so I make generalized statements, but I am aware that even though, let's say 80%, like I try to teach computer classes <coughs> to not the lowest common denominator, but I try to teach like I have a class at Chafee where, where uh, we talk about um, Word and Excel and, and it's, a, it's a software class. And so I try to teach it so that it's not super esoteric, but I try to teach the things that help the, what I think are the most people, like you know the little tricks and to, to be more efficient. But I always realize that, that not all of those things are gonna work for everybody because there are always exceptions to the rule, right? They're, you know, the format painter, using the format painter will save you a lot of time. Well, yeah, but not always, right? But most of the time it will. I realize that uh, I say, you know, students tend to blah, blah, blah. And there are always outliers. There's always exceptions to any kind of generalized rule. <clears throat> so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, don't get bogged down in the exceptions, by the way. That's another thing, uh, a common problem with critical thinking is that we assume because it's not true for everybody. Like smoking is, is you will die a lot younger if you smoke. But then you look at people um, in the past that lived to be 100 years old and they smoked like 10 cigars a day, right? Obviously that's an outlier. And you can't just list a handful of people that you know about or that you did research on that smoked their entire lives and they died you know, past the age of 100 and say smoking doesn't affect your health. But you can't uh, say you know, everybody that smokes is going to die young because there are always outliers. Does that make sense? Does it? Yeah. 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 
Okay, so you have to be careful about um, understanding that there are always exceptions to every kind of generalized rule. But you don't want to focus on those exceptions too much. We want to, uh, in, in the real world, accommodate pretty much everybody. But do we really want to penalize the 80 or 90% of people who are in this group to totally accommodate the you know, 15 or 20% of people in the other group? Does it make everybody's lives much harder because we're accommodating you know, five people out of 100 or three people out of 100? How many hoops do we have to jump through in order to accommodate them 70% of what, what it is that they would like or whatever. Does that make sense too? We have to have some kind of a balance. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so, the data that we are looking at also needs to be significant. And what basically that means is you can't cite statistics and data that don't have a direct influence on the problem that we're looking at. So I can't say, for instance, that everybody that I know that drinks coffee is healthier than the people that don't drink coffee. Is that significant? Is it a significant, does that have to do with, no, A, it's, it's the, the data itself is what we call um, antidotal, right? Because it's just what we experience in our lives and it's not studied. And B, are the, how many people do I know? Everybody that I, drink, that I know that drinks coffee is in really good shape. How many people is that? Five? 10? How many people do I know? <laughs> How many people do you actually physically know well enough in the real world? I shouldn't say physically. Uh, in the real world, do we know well enough to be able to say that they're in good health? And then, you know, what percentage of that are people that, that you know, fit a particular thing? I'm trying to think, uh, who do I know that drinks coffee a lot? I don't actually know 10 people that drink a lot of coffee, as much coffee as I do. I may know three people. So anyway, so we have to establish significance. And are these things relevant to uh, the problem that I'm trying to solve? I'm, I'm looking at my notes. <clears throat> so once we've done that and we've valued, uh, evaluated all of the arguments and we've decided that I think I'm pretty good Right? I think I'm, I'm good. I think all of the data that I have is relevant. I think it's as unbiased as it can possibly be. I think I'm objectively looking at my own biases and trying to remove those from making my decision. Uh, they are not, bi uh, let's see, uh, I'm not necessarily getting the, the answer that I want or I am getting the answer that I want. By the way, if if you are critically thinking about something and you're getting an answer that's reinforcing your preconceived notions about whatever it is that you were doing research on, you need to stop and really critically evaluate it because we are much more acceptable or uh, acceptant of things that already agree with us. So we have to be very careful about Hey, am, am I evaluating this data positively because I already agree with it and it supports my preconceived notions or my, my opinion already? And am I evaluating the stuff that doesn't agree with me because of my inherent bias that I, I, act, I want to reinforce what I already believe? So you really need to be even more critical about the stuff that agrees with you, <laughs> which is a pain in the butt because we 
we don't want to do that because we're human beings. We, we like it when people agree with us. Most of our friends, for instance, agree with most of the things that we do and the way we behave. Because if they don't, then there's constantly an argument and then we don't want to be with that person all the time because, or a lot, because there's always like, you know, a clash of the titans kind of, there's always, we're always clashing with one another. So we tend to be friends with people that agree with the things that we believe and that share experiences. As you get older, your friends will become more, how do I put this? I would bet that most of the friends that you have, and again, I'm making a, a, a generalized kind of statement, and I'm not saying that there aren't friends that you won't have outliers, but most of the friends that all of you have um, are in college or will be in college. And if you're a freshman, by the way, um, you don't count. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> If you're a freshman, give it a year and see what your group of friends looks like. Um, I'm going to guess that most of them will share the college experience with you. I have a couple of friends that didn't go to college, but um, I knew them in high school. So they're, they're kind of high school friends. And uh, so we have that in common. Does that kind of make sense? We tend to, be, uh, we're able to relate to others that share our experiences. So it's very difficult to bitch and moan to somebody about classes when they're not in classes. And so anyway, you understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> so be careful with um, data that kind of supports what it is that, that we want to, to have happen. So a preconceived outcome is, is where we should look even more critically when our data supports that preconceived outcome. Um, so let me talk about the, um, the coffee thing. So the first problem with the coffee thing is that there was an inherent bias to the question that I asked. And so I got results back because I got results that supported my query, basically, or that were tailored to my query. So I think last time we said the better way to phrase that would have been to say, coffee, uh, what are the health effects? of coffee. And that excludes the, is it good or bad? And then I can probably the results I get are more mixed and generic. So they don't already reinforce a bias. <clears throat> Secondly, um, look at the research. So with the coffee problem, I said that I got research that said, uh, if you stop drinking coffee, and because I didn't record this, I'm going to say it again, because I'm, I'm recording this one, uh, you will have decreased anxiety, you'll have healthier teeth, you'll lose weight, and you'll have a healthier heart. And when we typed in reasons to drink coffee, we got research that said uh, that you'll have lower rates of depression if you drink coffee. I wonder why that would be. Uh, you'll have a boost in memory, although it doesn't work for me. I'm an outlier. I can't remember anything. Um, longevity, you'll live longer. I don't know about that uh, personally, anecdotally. And you'll have a healthier heart, which is in direct contradiction to the, uh, if you stop drinking coffee, your heart will be healthier. <clears throat> so here, um, the focus is on the heart issue. And the first one that says, if you stop drinking coffee, that there's a 14% uh, decrease in coronary heart disease and a 20% decrease for strokes. 
And I'm going to guess that that has a little bit to do with caffeine, like a stroke, uh, you know, you get because you have high blood pressure, etc. Caffeine raises your blood pressure, that kind of stuff. Um, now, in the second study, uh, it said that moderate coffee uh, drinking, uh, moderate coffee drinkers had a lower incidence of coronary artery disease. So those seem to contradict each other. So we have to look at, for instance, who were the studies done on? Now, both of these uh, studies were from peer-reviewed real journals, medical journals. <clears throat> the, fir the first one, was based on literature review, which basically means they didn't do any original study. What they did was they looked at medical research and literature and then came up with a conclusion just from looking at other people's research, which seems like a pretty good idea. Right? You just combine a whole bunch of other people's studies and you say, hey, um, I seem to be able to draw the conclusion that, you know, coffee has these kind of stopping, not drinking coffee has these beneficial effects. The second one was based on uh, a large group of, uh, there were, I think, 20, 25,000 people, but they were, oh, it was done in Korea, in South Korea. So it was only Koreans. And so moderate coffee drinking, obviously, the effects on the heart, if you're only studying Koreans, what are the other things that affect heart health? Do Koreans eat a lot of fish? Uh, fish in omega-9, I think, uh, is heart healthy. Um, do they eat a lot of vegetables, right? Did, what, what are the other kind of things? This narrow kind of a focus, even though there's a large sample size, uh, it's only taking into account one group or a group of people who probably share other things in common. Again, I'm making a generalized statement, but there are probably a lot of things that South Korean lifestyle uh, or that South Koreans share or have in common with their lifestyle. Do they tend to walk a lot? Do they do a lot of uh, manual labor? Um, do, is the South Korean diet a certain way? It's like I talked about the whole drinking a glass of wine um, is good for you. And where did that come from? Well, it came from somebody said, hey, you know what? French people have a lower, and I'm paraphrasing, have lower rates of heart disease than some of the other groups in the surrounding countries. And so somebody did a study and they said, well, they, they tried to narrow it down and they said, well, French people drink wine with their meals. That's just the social norm. So most French people have wine from a young age, all through their lives, a cup, at least a couple of times a day. Lunch, dinner. I don't know if they're drinking wine at breakfast, <laughs> I think there are problems if you start drinking wine at breakfast. What time is it? It's seven o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? I'm having a glass of wine. <clears throat> yeah, it's a little early. But so the study came from that kind of, oh, we should, have, we should see if this is affecting. And then, by the way, in Italy, they also drink a lot of wine. And so that was the next step of the, the study was to study Italians um, because that's also a social norm in those countries. Um, my family is from Germany and they don't drink a lot of wine. They drink a lot of beer. And beer is just not that good for you, I don't think. But, um, but they do drink a lot of beer. It's just the way it is. That doesn't mean I don't know Germans that don't drink beer. Okay, um, I know plenty, but most people drink beer. 
They don't drink a lot of wine. Um, so anyway, uh, where was I going with that? Um, oh yeah, so, so uh, Koreans may have some kind of social uh, norm or norms in their country that are affecting heart, heart health also. Um, <clears throat> what else? Uh, but diet, this one mentions climate as being an issue because uh, different climates also affect our health. And so we get to step five, which is, step five was establishing significance of the data. So if I use those two studies, I should get to step five and go, you know what? Neither one of these was really significant. Neither one of these really made a case. Uh, the second one with the benefits of drinking moderate amounts of coffee is too uh, narrow a base since it's only in Korea. And I'm pretty sure it's only South Koreans. So I don't know if I can translate that to, you know, other countries. And the first one, they didn't do any studies of their own. And so I would have to then look at the studies that their conclusions are based on, which may or may not be too much work because they may have a whole bunch um, and evaluate each one of those. So really, uh, the results that I used in order to, to do this critical thinking exercise were too limited. And so I need to either base my opinion on more results, so go find some other ones that have a broader scope, or I need to say, hey, you know what? I, it, there, neither one of these is gonna help me make a decision, um, and so I don't know. Never be afraid to say, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. And the reason I don't have an opinion is because uh, I just don't know. I can't figure it out. I can't find it. Um, I'm not smart enough. No, I'm, I <laughs> don't say that. Um, <clears throat> but I don't want to work on it. I don't want to work too hard to, to have an opinion because I don't care. Right? Also, you are allowed not to care. You can, you can not care whether coffee is good for you or bad for you. It's perfectly fine. And you can drink five cups of coffee or two cups of coffee or, well, I would say 20 cups of coffee, but be, be careful in overdoing anything. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that we have to be aware of is that it's hard to be really sure of something because of those outliers. But you can be pretty sure. And don't be afraid of being pretty sure as long as you've done some research. Because one of the things that we have to be very aware of is that um, there are some traps that we can fall into when we think about critical thinking. And the traps typically have to do with, and I can't find my notes, I don't know why, where they are. The trap, the main trap is what we call group thinking. And that has to do with how we make decisions and how we think about things and what our brain actually does. And we live in a world right now where egocentric thinking is, how do I put this? Egocentric thinking is becoming more and more normal. And egocentric thinking is bad. And what is egocentric thinking? It's, uh, it's true because I believe it's true. Okay, it's true because we, the group that I belong to or I identify with, believe it's true. Now you can see that's kind of circular thinking. 
well, everybody I know thinks that um, we should raise the minimum wage, therefore it must be good to raise the minimum wage. Um, I think we should raise the minimum wage because I make the minimum wage. And so therefore that must be good because it'll be good for me. Or it sounds reasonable. I want to believe that this is true. So I'm going to believe it. These are all kind of pitfalls that we need to avoid. Um, I grew up and I have believed this my whole life. My parents believed it. I believe it. Most of my friends believe it. Therefore, it must be true. Also faulty. Uh, and the last one is that it's in my own self-interest to believe it. So which is kind of the minimum wage thing. I make minimum wage. Therefore, if the minimum wage goes up, it's beneficial to me. So I'm going to believe it's good that the minimum wage goes up. Just because it can't be bad because it's going to be better for me. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. Ivan shook his head, but I'm not sure why. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. So, just like half zoned out because I got like dispatched two hours ago from the hospital. Oh, Jesus, what happened? Eh, you know, having a seizure, hitting my head on the floor. Eh, oh, my so God. Unusual. Are you okay? Or are you going to be okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just a little uh, brain foggy. Okay. Well, I, I hope you feel much better in the coming days. Um, yeah, this is a bit of a, of a stretch if you've just had a, a problem. Because um, it's not the most exciting lecture in the whole world. But it does make me feel better. Yes. <laughs> uh, although I was really tired and feeling sorry for myself this morning. Oh, it still is morning. Although now I'm not because I haven't been to the, the, the hospital. Um, okay, now we cannot kind of avoid those feelings, those inherent feelings. And, and let me just dissect the um, minimum wage argument a little bit. And I'm going to uh, uh, take the opposite point of view from most people. And I'm going to say, hey, um, since, and by the way, whenever you do a critical thinking exercise, it's always a good idea to take the opposite point of view of whatever it is that you believe and try to dissect it and try to make arguments for it. And the reason is, what, what could the reason be for that? Tell me. You believe the minimum wage should be increased, right? And what you're trying to do is you're trying to critically think about why you believe that. So why would it be good to try to argue the opposite point of view? Because why? I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. Just to gain perspective of the other side and understand what the reasoning is behind that point of view. Yeah, it's very difficult to argue something, to argue with somebody, if you don't know where they're coming from. Which is why, why it's very dangerous to um, shut the other side up. Because then you no longer hear their point of view. Does that make sense? You might disagree with, with pe what other people are saying, but uh, just because you disagree with somebody doesn't mean that their arguments are completely wrong. Uh, we have to be very careful about making moral judgments about people just because they believe something. And it, it depends on what it is. You can make a moral judgment if they're Nazis. Um, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> you can't, for instance, or you shouldn't, you can, you can do whatever you want. Um, but if you know people who don't, and by the way, I, I, um, 
uh, I don't care whether the minimum wage is increased or not. <laughs> I'll just tell you my opinion. I don't care. Um, but I will tell you this. Um, <clears throat> you shouldn't say that the minimum wage, people who believe that the minimum wage should not be increased are morally reprehensible or morally wrong, and therefore we should never listen to them and anything that they have to say because their arguments could be valid. Just like if you're in the other camp, you shouldn't say that the people who believe the other way um, are morally reprehensible and they're evil. And so therefore, we don't need to listen to anything that they have to say. You might have a gut feeling about it, but you might not. So let's talk about the minimum wage in a, what I hope is a basically kind of an objective way. <clears throat> and this is just an exercise in critical thinking a bit, okay? So what am I doing here? I'm gonna do this. Now what did I do? Stop share, I shared the wrong thing, I'm sorry. Share, because I'm gonna show you um, that when I worked, when I started working, I was in high school, I had a job at Burger King. When I was a junior in high school, I started working at Burger King. And I made minimum wage. And so, <laughs> you'll be shocked. I made $3.25 an hour. I thought that was great, by the way. <clears throat> so, how much, how long did I make that minimum wage for? Now, I worked at Burger King through my senior year, so I worked there a little less than two years, I guess. I don't remember. Um, maybe 18 months, a year and a half, a year and three quarters. How long do you think that I made minimum wage? Whoops. While I worked there. Take a guess. Let's be proactive. Let's be a, a group discussion. How about that? Uh, the entire time? <laughs> no. Not even close. Six months? I made minimum wage during my probationary period, which I think was three months. And once they decided that I was uh, good enough to make french fries and come to work on time and not be uh, absent all the time because I was sick and they decided to keep me on, as soon as I was no longer on probation, I got a raise. And I think the raise was 20 cents. I'm pretty sure it was 20 cents. So I wasn't making minimum wage anymore. I was making more. And every three or four months, as long as I was working well uh, uh, or doing good work, I got another dime or 15 cent raise. And so by the time I left, I was making like four something. So minimum wage, in my experience, is not what you work, like you get hired at minimum wage, you're not working at minimum wage for the rest of your life. At least I don't think so. If you are do, because here's the two things, either you're gonna do your job well and you're gonna get a raise, or you're not gonna do your job well and you're gonna get fired. And so then you won't be making anything. And, and this is fast food and this is my experience in fast food. Had I wanted to make a career of fast food, a friend of mine who worked there did. He was a shift manager. He had worked there for two years, two and a half years. And he was a shift manager and he was making like, you know, seven bucks an hour, seven something an hour. 
And he eventually went on to become an assistant store manager. And then he went on to become a store manager and he was making way over minimum wage at that point. So <clears throat> there's an argument that people make that say the minimum wage should be a living wage, which means that you should be able to live on minimum wage. that assumes that you're never going to get a raise from minimum wage and that there is no chance for you to better yourself even within whatever industry or company that you're working for. So like I said, I worked for Burger King. There's only one place that you can work that is worse than Burger King in the fast food industry and that's McDonald's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, like, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, we would say, hey, at least we don't work at McDonald's, right? But if you worked at Carl's Jr., that was better than Burger King. Uh, if you worked at In-N-Out, obviously, that's a lot better. So <clears throat> is it a false argument to say that somebody who um, uh, is making win minimum wage needs a pay increase because they're going to work, they're going to do a minimum wage job for the rest of their lives and they're only gonna make minimum wage. It's probably a false argument in most instances. Most people are going to get a raise or they're gonna get fired because either you're good at your job and the company wants to keep you and what's the incentive to keep you is to pay you a little bit more and to make sure that you get a little bit of a raise every once in a while so that you stay and don't go to another place where they're gonna pay you more. Does that, that makes common sense to me. If you keep me at minimum wage and I have two years of, of experience in fast food, I can probably find a, a job somewhere else working in fast food where they're gonna say, hey, you have two years, I can hire you with two years of experience or you with no experience. Who are they gonna hire, right? So this typically goes up over time. And like I said, I was making, I, I think I was making 475 or 485 when I quit, which doesn't sound a lot now, but um, uh, I could buy, let's see, uh, when I was working a like combo meal, fries, uh, Coke or drink and a burger was like a dollar 75. So that was, it turned out it was about a half an hour's worth of work or 25 minutes worth of work. So it, it was a lot less expensive. So this was actually a lot of money. Um, I saved a crap loads of money or I was able to save. Now also I lived at home. I was in high school. I lived at home. So I didn't have any expenses. Um, uh, you know, uh, food was bought. So it was only me uh, doing things and buying, you know, speakers and, and music and that kind of stuff. Uh, was this a living wage at the time? No, you couldn't raise a family on this. But minimum wage isn't there to raise a family. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that you have to jump up the ladder a little bit. You can't be a fry cook and have like four kids. At least that's not how I was raised. You have to be like an assistant manager. And by the way, I worked retail and I was an assistant store manager. Uh, in a music store later on in my life. And I made, uh, hell, I was making um, uh, 12 something an hour, which was almost three times the minimum wage at that point. So should three times the minimum wage be uh, uh, waged? I could live on it. I lived on my own. I, I rented an apartment. I bought my food and I went out and did stuff. So I was able to live on that. Would I have been able to support four other people? No, but I was able to support myself. Had I wanted to, I probably could have climbed the ladder, and, but that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to school and so, well, you understand. So let me say something else here about minimum wage and what happens when, um, and what the real issue is. The real issue is that 
no matter what the minimum wage is, let's say that it's $10. The real issue is disposable income. And I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but disposable income is the income that you have left over after all of your expenses. So, <clears throat> here is what I need to make minimally in order to pay my bills. So let's say that I need to make $7 an hour. And these numbers are just, I'm just pulling these out of my rear end, okay? It's just an example. It's not statistically relevant. And let's say that I make $10 an hour. And $7 covers my bills and covers my living expenses. And so what's my disposable income? $3. So I can go buy stuff, like I can go out to eat. I can uh, buy a shirt. I don't know if, if shirts are an expense, but I can buy a, another pair of shoes. I have two pairs of shoes, work shoes and, and, and regular shoes, but I can buy a third pair of shoes or a fourth pair of shoes. I can go get my hair done or my nails done, or I can go to a spa. I can go watch a movie. That's what this three dollars represents. Now what happens when we raise the minimum wage? So let's say I raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars because I can make that zero or five very quickly. What happens to my what happens since everybody now who is making minimum wage in the workforce is making $15 an hour instead of $10 an hour. What happens to my expenses? They go up. They go up. Okay. So let's say that this goes up to let's say it doesn't go up as much, but it goes up to $11. Okay, so now I have $4 instead of $3 of disposable income. What has happened to all of those things that I wanna buy? I wanna go to McDonald's and buy a meal. What's happened there? All the prices have gone up, right? So is my disposable income really more? Or did the price go up so much because all of these people have to, um, like McDonald's, let's just use McDonald's. Everybody that works at McDonald's now makes $15 an hour instead of 10, assuming that everybody made minimum wage. So their expenses have gone up. So where, where do they recoup that, that lost or the expenses that they have to pay in extra? Well, they recoup it from people who buy their product, right? And so when you go buy a Big Mac meal, it doesn't cost $5 anymore, it costs six fifty. dollars So does the amount of disposable income for somebody who is making minimum wage really increase that dr dramatically? Is their buying power significantly more? And you can make the minimum wage 45 bucks an hour, but you're gonna spend $20 on a Big Mac meal. So what actually happens is it hurts uh, raising the minimum wage actually hurts anybody that's making more than minimum wage. Which if we go back to the previous kind of model of my experience, and like I said, this is just an antidotal kind of way of, of an analyzing critical thinking. And that is, does everybody always make minimum wage over the years. And like I said, I made minimum wage for three months and this is a no skill. I'm learning how to make, this is, I was the fry cook. So I learned, I, I made French fries, onion rings, and I did specialty sandwiches. So like 
chicken sandwiches and those kind of things that weren't uh, burger patty based sandwiches. Those fish sandwiches, those were all fried instead of grilled. So I made all of that. So it's, it's not, a, a, you know, anybody can do this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure anybody can do it. Uh, I was able to do it and I didn't know anything. Um, <clears throat> and I was able, at, at some point, I, be, I was on the, the dinner rush shift because I was fast and, and I didn't screw stuff up. And I was on time. And I, like I said, I came to work. Um, so uh, do people actually always make minimum wage? And if I'm making, let's say that I'm making $10, the minimum wage is $5. And it gets increased, the minimum wage gets increased to $7. You think I'm going to go to 12? No. All the people that are above will stay at whatever pay rate they're at. Because the company isn't going to say, hey, you guys making 25 bucks, now we're going to make 27. And so we have to, like, this all sounds really good, right? It sounds like it's, it's a reasonable argument to make. At least I think it sounds like a reasonable argument. But this is all antidotal. Everything that I just to told you is just uh, based on a progression of logic. It's not based on any scientific research. So, does it make logical sense? Sure. Uh, and by the way, like I said, I personally don't really have a, a, an opinion on whether the minimum wage should be increased or decreased. Uh, and the reason is, is because I see advantages and disadvantages to both sides. That's one. Two, I, I tend to uh, fall into the camp. If I had to make a decision, you could probably tell. I fall into the camp where I don't want the minimum wage increased too much. And the reason for that is because of a selfish interest of mine. I have a self uh, interest. So like I said, there's egocentric thinking that we have to identify, right? And one of those things was it's, I want it to be true because it's in my selfish interest to believe it. And what is my selfish, what do you think my selfish interest is that I would, I want the minimum wage to kind of stay stable and not double or triple take a wild guess what it is all the money you have becomes less valuable yeah because i don't make minimum wage right so you can assume that i don't make minimum wage and actually you can assume that i make a lot more than minimum wage okay but what's going to happen to the big mac meal if minimum wage goes up it's going to go up is my pay going to go up? No. So what's going to happen is that everything is going to be more expensive for me and I will have less disposable income. And by the way, everything goes up. It's just like when you tax gasoline. Every, the cost of milk goes up. And why is that? Why, when the price of gasoline goes up, does the cost of milk go up? It's more expensive to deliver the milk. Yeah, because we've all seen how things get delivered. They get delivered in big-ass semi-trucks. And what do they suck? They suck gasoline. Um, and so when that price goes up, you go to the grocery store and everything costs more. So... <clears throat> it, I have a selfish interest that I recognize, which is why I try to, because I don't really care all that much about it. I don't want the minimum wage to double because I think that would be a big shock to the, to the prices on everything. Um, and it, and by the way, here's the other thing. If you're super rich, I am not super rich. If you're super rich, you could care less. If I made $20 million a year, 
I could care less whether a Big Mac meal costs five bucks or 10 bucks or 20 bucks because my level and my expenses are, you know, this is my income, this is my expenses way down here. So whether I have to pay a little bit more comparatively up here, but the lower down you are on the economic scale or the economic ladder, the more small price increases affect um, your ability to spend money. So for instance, a few years ago, we had like a, a 75 cent increase in taxes on the gallon of gasoline. So people who were making regular normal kind of wages, minimum wage and a couple of bucks above or so, those were the people who were impacted the most. Because if you're spending 50 cents more on a gallon of gas, you know, that turns out to be 20 bucks per fill up or 10 bucks more a fill up. And if you only have, you know, if your budget is very narrow, you know, that 10 bucks or 15 bucks or 20 bucks a couple of times a month is a big chunk. Whereas if you're making, you know, $300,000 a year, you know, okay, whatever. You know, it costs me more. I'll go to Starbucks, you know, less. <laughs> so, the, that's one of the things that we can we could, should look at when it comes to critical thinking, and that is, you know, analyzing something. And like I said, if I was to really critically um, analyze the whole minimum wage thing, I would actually do some research and look at the research, what has been done, and does that research fit my logical kind of preconceptions. And if it does, what should I do? If the research fits my preconceptions, my logical preconceptions, what should I do? Go and find the other argument. Yeah, make sure that I really look at the other side and make sure that I weigh the other side a little bit more um, and look at that more critically because um, I want to make sure that I'm not biased in, in my outcome isn't biased because that's what I was believing kind of, I sort of believe that to begin with and I want it to be and it fits and I found research that fits and so I'm happy but I didn't look at the opposite side. So you really need to make, because somebody else is gonna, gonna argue that you know, we should raise it. And so I should know what their arguments are and um, how to deal with those. And so again, it makes you a, a more intelligent person if you know the other side's arguments. Um, once you even make up your mind, you should always look at what the other side is, 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 is doing and, and what new, and by the way, once you've formed an opinion, opinions are, uh, or you've made a decision on something because you use critical thinking, oh, time's up. Um, so let me finish this thought. Uh, because you've used critical thinking, then <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you stay static. You should reevaluate every once in a while. Are, is there new data that supports or disproves what I believe? You don't have to constantly do it. You don't have to constantly be, oh crap, uh, what's going on? What's going on? But if something comes up that's contrary, you should look into it and not just hold fast to whatever belief that you've believed in or whatever opinion you've had for years um, because you did some critical thinking way back when. Um, so anyway. Uh, there you go. That is, uh, we're going to talk more about egocentric thinking the next time and how decision making and how our um, making all kinds of small decisions about nonsense all the time actually hurts our decision making when it comes to making important decisions and deciding our core beliefs, that kind of thing, and how the uh, modern social 
world where we can't stay off our phones for five seconds um, is really kind of causing us to have um, problems with and, and getting away from critical thinking. So that's what we're going to talk about um, next time. Uh, then we're going to uh, talk about, um, probably next week, about how problem solving is related to critical thinking and how problem solving is what we really want to do when we are looking at uh, any kind of a problem. But for this class, uh, particularly programming problems. So when, we, when it comes to creating a program, what we're really doing is problem solving using our critical thinking skills and uh, being logical. So using logic. Okay, so having said that, um, I'll see you guys later. Have a, have a good, uh, if there are any questions, let me know. Um, I'll stop sharing and I'll stop recording. <laughs>